wonderful to be here in Valdosta tonight, Lowndes County. I want to thank Gretchen and the Lowndes County uh, Democratic Party for this invitation and opportunity to come out here and talk a little bit about my candidacy, talk about the important issues that are facing our nation and facing this community every, every day. Uh, as Gretchen said, my, my name is Dr. Bronco Radlovachki, and uh, I go by Dr. Red. That's, uh, that's one of my patients and families that I care for uh, have affectionately named me because I think they struggle with Rod Lobotchke, and I don't blame them. <laughs> uh, I am originally from the former Yugoslavia, I was born in Belgrade, so that's in, in Europe, and we moved uh, to the United States when I was seven years old, and so I'm a first generation immigrant, and I'll talk a little bit about that because that really does have a bearing on some of my stand on, on different issues. Uh, but, you know, uh, let, let me just start by addressing the young people who are here in the audience, and I just want to commend you for being here. Uh, it's such a, it's a wonderful thing to be a, a young person and to always take an interest in civic, uh, in, in this community and, and one's civic responsibility. I remember someone asked uh, a question earlier about, you know, what did you do when, when you were, you know, you know in our, our age or in our grade? And I remember exactly what I connected to around us, uh, government when I was in the eighth grade. And at that time, uh, I'm a public school kid, so K through 12, uh, I was in public school. And in the eighth grade, we had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. Uh, and visit the Capitol and take a tour of the Capitol and, and the monuments. And I just, that, that impression uh, has, has stayed with me uh, the rest of my life. And so uh, I don't know if you all will have an opportunity to do something like that, but I think this is certainly a step in understanding the role of government in, in life here in Valdosta, but also the government at the state level and our federal government. And we'll be talking about some of those issues uh, tonight. So I just want to commend you all for, for being here and, and as you begin your journey as, uh, as the citizens in our, in our community. Now, I'm a physician, so I'm a medical doctor, and I'm in private practice. Uh, uh, as Gretchen said, I'm from Atlanta, and I'm a psychiatrist. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be, uh, that we'll discuss that relates to mental health and also my positions and views on uh, the very important topic of health care. And that's something that's been in the news quite a bit the past couple of months with the rollout of the Affordable Care Act, also known as the Care. Uh, and, and that does shape up quite a bit of my understanding and my desire to be of service. Now, I've never held public office before. I'm not an elected official. I haven't held public office. And yet, for the past six years, I've done a lot of mental health advocacy around reforms for a state psychiatric hospital system here in Georgia. Some of you may recall that uh, six years ago, the, AJ, the AJC, the paper in Atlanta, uh, did an investigative series called The Hidden Shame, and they documented that over 100 individuals had died under suspicious circumstances in our state psychiatric hospitals. And these were circumstances due to neglect and negligence and also inadequate uh, staffing and, and lack of resources. And I uh, was following that story and got very much concerned that these individuals were not getting the care that they needed. And so I joined up with a group of statewide mental health advocacy organizations like Mental Health America, uh, the National Alliance of Mental Illness, and the Carter Center, which is also in, uh, in, in Atlanta. And together, we were able to get the state to put in over $50 million to help improve conditions in these hospitals and also increase resources to the communities to make sure that these individuals did go back into the hospital. So that was really a wonderful outcome. In fact, it was a phenomenal outcome, um, given that the state of the economy over the past few years has not been strong, um, battered by the recession, and yet the state were able to uh, uh, you know, present arguments that were compelling enough with a little help from the United States Justice Department to, uh, to get our state leaders to, to apportion those funds to those hospitals. And for me, that, that effort was really a second job. I mean, that's how much time uh, it took, and it took away from my practice, took away from my family. And yet I, was, I felt called to do it. I felt it was an important opportunity to give back to the community. And I did that. I did that effort uh, without, without compensation. It was a volunteer. Again, feeling called and feeling it's an important opportunity to give back. Now, even before going into medicine and pursuing a career in healthcare, I worked, uh, I worked in New York City. I worked on Wall Street as, a, as an investment banker. And then I went to pursue and obtain my Master's in Business Administration, my MBA from the University of Chicago. So I, I, I believe that my background in finance and in healthcare and running a small business as a solo practitioner 
And also my mental health advocacy work has really equipped me to be a very strong and a very effective voice for all of Georgia up in the Capitol and work in the true spirit of bipartisanship in an effort to end the gridlock that's been plaguing our nation for the past few years. Now many people ask me, say, Dr. Rad, you know, how can you make a difference uh, up in Washington? I think, that's, I think that's a great question. I think one of, my, one of my answer to that question is, as a medical doctor, I'm trained to address very complex, very difficult problems. And when individuals and their families come to me, they're often in crisis. And they need help, and they need help now. Now, it doesn't matter to me whether they're a Republican, or a Democrat, or a Libertarian, or a Tea Party, or a Progressive, or a Liberal, or a Conservative. It just doesn't matter. Those labels are not important when people enter my office. They need help, and I'm here to help them. And so when we, when we strip away those labels and we're able to focus on the problem, you know, solutions to complex problems really become readily apparent. And that's the kind of training, and that's the kind of perspective and attitude and approach I plan to bring to Washington. It's an, it's an approach that, that, that really sets aside labels. It's an approach that says we all have a common problem, we have a, a common a obligation and responsibility to solve those problems on behalf of our constituents, the people we, see, the, we serve, and the people of the United States of America. And I believe that will be an effective uh, uh, approach. Now, there are several issues that are very close to my heart. I want to talk about them with you all and share, with them, uh, share about them. And one of them is certainly health care. And as a physician, uh, it's very important to me uh, that, that the individuals that I serve, and certainly those in our community, in our state, in our nation, have adequate health care, and that they have good quality health care to the extent that that can be provided, and they can, they can they have access to that. So the rollout of the Affordable Care Act is really very timely. I know there's been a lot of news about it, and certainly there's been a lot of problems with the implementation of it. I don't think anyone's happy with that. I think we can all agree that could have been done better. And yet, I believe that beyond that, that the point of that health care was to do two things. One was to increase access to health care that I think, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, I think we all value that. And we all believe that that's an important thing for individuals to have. And I believe it's a right. I don't believe it's a privilege. I believe health care is a right for all of you. And so I believe it's incumbent on, on elected officials and public officials to, 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 to strive to make sure that our residents, our citizens, have access to that kind of health care. And I believe the Affordable Care Act, imperfect as it is, is a step in that direction. Not only that, but also strives to make health care affordable. Now, there's, some, there's some discussion about whether it does that for some folks and not for other folks. But let me say that that was its goal. And I think that, that ultimately, uh, we're going to find out more about it as time goes on. Now, you know, the implementation has just started, so we really don't know what the answers are to this, to this initiative. Will it succeed, will it fail? Personally, I believe it's going to succeed. I think it's succeeding not as much as a piece of legislation, but the idea, the idea of health care, access, affordability. Those are things we need to pursue. And I think another thing we can all agree on, whether we're Republicans or Democrats or liberals or Tea Partyers or progressives or whoever, is that the system that we currently have is broken. It is broken, it's a failure, demonstrably a failure. And, over, and we've known that for, for, for many years, and many different leaders have acknowledged that fact. But no one has been able to, to move forward and develop a program and get it passed through Congress and then sign it by the, get it signed by the president and have the Supreme Court you know, stamp its approval on it, except for this legislation. So we've come a long way. We spent a lot of time talking about this problem. Now we have a solution. Is it perfect? It isn't perfect. But that's OK. Social Security, when it first came out, wasn't perfect. Medicare, when it first came out, that wasn't perfect either. But I don't think anyone is talking about, let's wipe out these programs. You know, those, are, those are programs that, that, that support very vulnerable individuals. And I think this, this legislation will be tweaked, it will be changed, and it needs to be changed. And we already know that. And one of the things, one, one of the ways that's already been changed is that the employer mandate has been put out for a year. And I agree with that decision. I think employers need to have time to study this uh, piece of legislation. You understand how it's going to impact their companies, and they need to be able to have that information in order to make the best decision possible about how to run their company. So I think you know decisions like that and other changes are going to be needed, and that's okay. We shouldn't be afraid of that. But we should also not make sure that we don't throw the baby out with the bathroom. 
The things that need to be changed do need to be changed. The good things about it do need to be changed. So let's talk a little bit about what are some of those good things. I talked about access to health care for uh, you know, tens of millions of our, of our citizens around the country, including hundreds of thousands in, uh, here in Georgia. Uh, affordable health care, those are two things. Now, we we'll talk about the end of pre-existing conditions. Going forward, starting on January 1st, having a pre-existing condition is not going to be uh, a concern for individuals. Now, how big is that? How, how important is that? Well, let me tell you a personal story about pre-existing conditions. I'm, uh, I'm 50, 51 years old. Two years ago, at the age of 49, uh, I was unexpectedly diagnosed with colon cancer. Now, I'm someone who takes pride in, in my health and in my well-being. I'm, I'm a runner. I've run several 10Ks. I've completed seven marathons, including qualifying and completing the Boston Marathon. And I've run three ultra marathons. These are 50 plus mile races. So I'm in good shape. I had no symptoms. I had met my calendar year deductible in 2011, and I decided because it, at the age of 50 the following year, I was going to get a colonoscopy, which is the recommended age for a screening colonoscopy. I got that done a year early, thinking, no sweat. I'm in good shape. I'm going to knock this out. We'll have to go on to wait till next year to pay two or three thousand dollars. And I found out, much to my surprise, my family's surprise, that there was a tumor in my colon. And that had to come out. And it did come out two weeks later, uh, uh, two weeks ago last Thanksgiving. And following that, I found out that I need, uh, it had spread a bit. And so I needed chemotherapy. So I completed six months of chemotherapy in May of last year. I'm healthy, feel great, feel strong. But you know what? Under our old system, I would have been afraid to lose my health insurance because there's no way in the world, under the old system, under our current system, that anyone was going to insure me, was going to pick up my insurance with that pre-existing condition. And so I, I would have been at the mercy of these health insurance companies. They could have increased my rates 5%, 10%, 15% a year. And in fact, my health insurance, and probably most of us, up and up and through this point, has been going up on an annual basis. I purchase individual insurance. I'm a solo practitioner. So my health insurance has been going up, up, up anyway. But with that pre-existing condition, I could be guaranteed that I, I would not be able to find any other insurance. I would have to be uh, paying what the insurance companies charge. I have no choice. But now, this, this reform, healthcare reform, is a game changer. Because it introduces the opportunity for competition in my health plans. And this is all the old private insurance plan. And so now, I don't have to be afraid. In fact, I can look for other insurance. I can look for better coverage, more affordable insurance. And stuff to let you know, I did just that last night. I knew I was coming here today, and I also knew that there was a lot made in the, in the media about uh, uh, the administration's effort to revamp and improve the marketplace exchange at healthcare.gov. So I wanted to try it out. I wanted to see, you know, what, what have they done with that, with that healthcare exchange? And so my wife and I got on it last night. It worked well. It was simple. It was straightforward. It was easy to access. We were able to compare different plans. There were dozens of plans here in the state of Georgia. And what we found was that uh, with respect to health insurance options, our, our uh, the plans that we were qualified for, and we, weren't quali we didn't qualify for any subsidies or any kind of home insurance, uh, uh, premium, uh, premium tax credits or any home insurance subsidies. Nevertheless, our, our choices range from a reduction in our premium anywhere from fifty to seven hundred dollars a month. Those were that was the range, and our deductible, which currently is at five thousand dollars before insurance kicks in, our deductible options were, were down uh, to two to twenty five hundred, two thousand five hundred dollars, or even less. So it looks like for our family of four, we've got two teenagers, we're going to benefit from this health care. I'm not saying everyone will. But what I am going to suggest to you is that you should invest in research and find out. If you have an option to, to purchase insurance on the marketplace, check it out. It seems to be working. It's certainly working much better than it was earlier. So give it a chance uh, and, and just educate yourselves. It might work for you in, as far as getting a uh, better uh, deal on your health insurance. It might not. I don't know. It, it's going to benefit our family greatly. So I'm glad I did. So, so health care. Uh, so, so from that standpoint, I do think health, health care legislation, health care reform is important. And as a candidate, what I've been doing over the past couple months 
is I've actually been organizing town hall meetings on the Affordable Care Act. I've brought in navigators. Why? Because I want people in Georgia to understand what their rights are, how this legislation, if it can, what benefits that they, you know, can they have from it. Not, it's not a political thing, it's not a Democrat or Republican thing, it's an information thing, it's an education thing. This is the law. It's been, it's been signed by the President, the Supreme Court's, uh, you know, uh, passed it. So, so we need to try and educate individuals and individuals in our, in our communities about can they benefit from it. And, and, and I want people to have that information. So we've gone around, I've done a couple of town uh, meetings about that. In fact, today I brought a document, uh, it's an FAQ on the Affordable Care Act. Again, it's a nonpartisan uh, piece of information. It strictly gives uh, answers to uh, some common questions uh, about the Affordable Care Act. And I encourage you to uh, pick up a, a copy of that. You can also uh, uh, find uh, that uh, FAQ on our campaign website. If you go to drradforsenate.com, you'll find out information about, uh, about that FAQ, and you can download it, and you, or you can simply read it. Again, it's not a partisan document. It's strictly about giving information to people and equipping individuals to make the best decision for themselves and their families. So uh, let, let me talk about another issue that's close to my heart, and that's immigration and immigration reform. As I mentioned, I'm a first-generation immigrant. Uh, came to this country from the former Yugoslavia, a, a communist country. Uh, so I understand what it's like to, to live under those circumstances, and I'm, I have to tell you, I'm so glad that we live in this country, and the United States is a country that is. And, and I believe in the free market economy. I believe in the opportunities that, that it provides for everybody. But let me also, and, and let me tell you a little bit about my, uh, my, 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 my family of origin. Growing up, I grew up living uh, with, uh, in, 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 in humble surroundings. I grew up living with my maternal grandparents. So we had, uh, it was a three, it was a three room apartment that we shared. My grandparents uh, lived in one room. They slept and I was in the living room. My mother and brother slept in, a, in, a, in the second bedroom and I didn't have a bed. So for me, they put together two chairs and I slept on two sofa chairs. And that was my bed for, uh, for the four, first four years of my life. But you know what? That wasn't a problem. We had a, a small, tight family. I thought, this is, this is great. My grandparents are around all the time. It's like having a second mom. It was wonderful. But I, I say that to you to, to let you know that I understand when people, te people talk about overcoming their circumstances and aspiring to more. So when, we, when our family moved to the United States, and let me just mention this, before we moved to the United States, we lived in Africa. We, moved, uh, we lived in Khartoum, Sudan. Uh, because my father is a medical researcher and he had the opportunity to do some research at the University of Khartoum Medical Center. So we lived there for three years and then moved to the United States to settled in Chicago when I was seven years old. And there, again, we lived in a, an apartment for the first five years uh, that we were here in the United States. Uh, shared a room with my brother. You know, it worked out all right. Um, it's important for you to understand that, I, that to me, it's very important that we provide opportunities to individuals who have come to this country to make a contribution, who want to be productive, who are ready to be productive, and who are investing in this country and putting themselves in positions to make a difference. Uh, and I say that with respect to immigration reform. I believe there are a lot of people in this, in this country you know, under similar circumstances. We have a lot of high-skilled immigrants coming from other countries, uh, much like uh, uh, my, you know, my family when, when we came over here. And I, I will say this too, that I'm a naturalized citizen, that we came to this country, we, were, we came here legally, uh, you know, uh, and I understand that that's, that that's an area of concern uh, in, in much of this uh, of our country too, about how people came into this country. And let me say it also, we also there's also need in this country for low-skilled labor. And I think that's the area that, that, great, that draws a lot of attention because it's a lot of our low-skilled uh, uh, immigrants that are here on a, on, a, on a undocumented basis. And I want to tell you, that I do support the uh, immigration reform bill that was sent out, that was passed out of the uh, Senate and is now awaiting uh, discussion in, in, the, in the House of Representatives. And I support it because most of those people who are talking, those who are undocumented, have come over and they've sacrificed a great deal to come to this country. And they're, and they're ready to work. And in fact, they are working. And, and in many instances, they're doing jobs that many Americans don't want to do. And yet, we need them. We need their labor to, to take care of our crops, take care of our uh, uh, businesses. 
whether America is doing it or someone, we need, we need those individuals. We can't deny that. In fact, we're not denying that. We're bringing, we're allowing them to, to come in and work here. But then we're saying, but you can't really benefit from the, from the full uh, 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 aspect of, of, this, of this country. You, you, can't, you can't have citizenship. Well, I think, that, as I said, these individuals are willing to work hard, willing to pay taxes, willing to pay fines, uh, and, and sacrifice, and willing to start at the bottom so that their future generations can rise to the top and maybe one day stand here where I'm standing here talking to you about not being able to serve their country. So I believe we ought, we ought to have uh, a process that allows a pathway for those individuals who are already in sort of who are working hard and want to make a contribution, make a difference. And, and let me talk about, and, and so that's, you know, when we're, talk, when we're talking about my campaign, we're talking about opportunities, whether it's an opportunity for health care, whether it's an opportunity for citizenship, and the last thing we're just talking about is, is educational opportunities. As I mentioned before, I'm a public school teacher, proud of that, felt I had great opportunities coming out of uh, public school, had wonderful teachers, not everyone was so great, but by and large, these were committed professionals who knew what they were doing, they cared for us, they made time for us and our families, and I believe I, I want to support that. I want to make sure that individuals in this country have, have access to quality education so that they can have the skills that they, they need to be successful in the world uh, that, that, that awaits them. So um, now that, that's a very important part of my, of my platform. I'm glad to talk a little bit more about that, uh, maybe in the Q&A. Let me uh, lastly focus on one other issue, and that has to do with our Economy and, and uh, the economy has shown signs of rebounding, and yet uh, there are those who uh, continue to talk about our need to focus on the uh, deficit and, 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 and the fiscal issues, uh, such as such as the budget deficit. And they talk about the, the you know the need for for more cuts, and you know, I, I understand that. I understand that we, we 